Let's go to Proverbs chapter 13, if you would, please. Proverbs chapter 13, and stand with me. Proverbs chapter 13, and verse number 15. We'll honor God's word here by standing. Let's read it together. Proverbs 13, 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for that great special. Thank you for the good crowd you've gathered here in your house. And Lord, we sure do love you. And uh, Lord, we sure do invite your presence here. Uh, we ask that the Holy Ghost would have its will and in, in its way in our hearts and lives this morning. And you'd be with me as I try to deliver this message. Help me now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, the title of the sermon this morning is The School of Hard Knocks. The School of Hard Knocks. Now, I get asked sometimes if I have a degree. And I was uh, filling out that paperwork for Jehovah Jireh, that grant, and they asked me, did I have a degree? I think something like that. And actually, I've got three of them. I've got three degrees. <clears throat> Number one, I have a Ph.D. Uh, not long after I got married, about 25 years ago, my daddy gave me a set of Sears and Roebuck wooden handle post hole diggers. Amen? And uh, they ended up breaking. I don't know, probably seven, eight years ago they broke. And I went to Tractor Supply and got me uh, some metal handled post hole diggers. So I suspect this Ph.D. will last me a little bit longer. Amen? <laughs> Uh, so number one, I got a Ph.D. Number two, I've got a deacon's degree. The Bible talks about in 1 Timothy 3.13. It says, For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know if I used the office well. I was there for a uh, deacon. I was there deacon about seven years as it, uh, there at uh, Texas Baptist. I, I at least got a D+. Plus. I feel like I at least got a D plus because my pastor ordained me and sent me out to start a church. Uh, so I don't think he would have done that if I'd have got a failing grade. I don't, I don't think I, I used, I don't know if I used it well, but I at least got a D plus. And uh, so number one, I got a PhD. Number two, I got a deacon's degree. And number three, I actually have a doctor's degree from the School of Hard Knocks. Amen. When you're hard headed like me, sometimes the Lord has to put you through the School of Hard Knocks. Hard heads oftentimes have to go through the school of hard knocks. Now, here's what the Cambridge Dictionary says about the school of hard knocks. If you learn something in the school of hard knocks, you learn it as a result of difficult or unpleasant experiences. Now, Proverbs 13, 15 says, Good understanding give a favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Now, that's true for the saved or unsaved. You transgress God's law, no matter if you're saved or unsaved, you're going to have a hard time. Right. It's going to be hard on you and more likely hard on your hind parts. Amen. <laughs> now, again, it's true for the saved and unsaved. I was just home in North Carolina back in October, and <clears throat> I saw a man uh, that was from my hometown, a little small town, it's about 200 people. And I've known this man all my life. And uh, he's probably, I would imagine he's probably 55, but he looked 75. I, I, it, 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 the rumor is that he's smoked at least a half a million dollars in crack cocaine. Half a million dollars. His dad was wealthy. When he passed, he left him, I think, uh, three, $400,000. And they say he blew through that in about a year uh, on crack cocaine. Now, he seems to be clean now, uh, from what I hear, but you can't reverse the damage of a hard life. He's got hard life written all over him. 55 years old, looks 75. You ever seen someone and thought, man, they've had, they must have had a hard life? You can tell that sin has had a great effect on them. Sin has aged them. I was just at Lowe's recently, and uh, the lady was helping me there at the uh, self-checkout because she was helping me get my military discount applied. And, uh, man, she had her whole arm was just cut up where she had just cut herself. 
I'll never forget when me and Brother Keith were soul winning one day. And uh, uh, this, we, we, not, we walked up to this lady's porch. She was on her back porch. And uh, we asked her if she was 100% sure if she died, if she'd go to heaven. And she said she wasn't. And tears started streaming down her face. And she said she, she was reaching out. She needed help. And she pointed to her arms. And she had just cut herself all up. And we ended up leading her to Christ. Amen. And uh, she came and visited our church. I believe she got baptized here, if not mistaken. But she visited our church a few times. Went and picked her up in the van. <clears throat> but so you could tell she had had a hard life. Sometimes you might see people with meth sores. You can look at people and say, man, uh, they, they've had a hard life. They, they've had a life of drugs, drug abuse. A lot of meth heads have what they call meth sores. Uh, when they do meth, it feels like, uh, this is actually a, a, a medical term for it, where it feels like something's crawling on their skin. They call it meth mites. That's the slang term for it, meth mites. And they're obsessively picking at themselves, picking at their face. And they have sores all over them. And you can look at them and you can tell, wow, they've had a hard life. Now, this is true for believers also. If you're a believer and you want to go out of here, you're a young person, you grew up in a church like this, and you want to go out of here and you want to live contrary to the laws of God, expect a hard life. The Lord will teach you some hard lessons because He loves you and wants you to straighten up and fly right and do right. Expect chastisement. Expect uh, uh, hard lessons. Amen. You know, people want to give us a hard time about being once saved, always saved. And we believe strongly in once saved, always saved. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, but they, they, they look at us and, and try to abuse us and say, oh, y'all uh, y'all use once saved, always saved as a license to sin. Well, first of all, you don't need a license to sin. It comes real naturally. You don't need a license to sin. But see, it's funny how the people who think they can lose their salvation or they think they have to keep their salvation, they never do a good job with it. It's like, well, how are you doing that, buddy? You got to work to keep yourself saved. You, you think you got to, uh, you know, you, you're working to not lose your salvation. Well, everyone I've ever talked to that believed that wasn't doing a good job at it. We, we believe in once saved, always saved, but we also understand there's consequences if we sin. The lake of fire is not one of them, but there's plenty of other consequences, amen? The lake of fire could be a consequence for your, one of your unsaved children. <clears throat> but there's plenty of consequences. One of the consequences of you know, uh, being saved and, 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 and not living for the Lord, transgressing God's law, is a hard life, a hard rod on your backside. Amen? Amen. There's plenty of consequences. Now, I have personally made some bad decisions, and I've had to learn the hard way going through the school of hard knocks. And I want to tell you four lessons that I had to learn in the school of hard knocks. Some have been years ago, some have been recent. But I'm going to give you four quick lessons I've learned in the school of hard knocks. Number one, the lesson of not listening to my pastor. This has been very painful for me over the years. Uh, let me give you a verse here in Hebrews 13, 7. Hebrews 13, 7. Uh, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, Amen. considering the end of their conversation. It says, who faith, faith follow? We're supposed to follow the faith of our pastor. Right. It says, considering the end of their conversation. That means you need to look uh, at where your pastor is headed, the direction he's going in. And if it looks like he's going in the right direction, conversation is more than just what comes out of your mouth. It actually it has to do with just behavior in general. And the Bible teaches that if it looks like your pastor is going in the right direction, and I don't think you'd be here or, or you'd be a member of that church if you didn't feel that way, then you're supposed to follow his faith. Amen. Now, 
before I was a pastor, the Lord gave me pastors to watch for my soul. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches the pastors watch for your soul. And if the direction that my pastors were heading in looked right, I was supposed to follow their faith. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not trying to say we should have blind loyalty to a pastor. No, sir, you'll never hear me teach that. That's why it says, considering the end of their conversation. I'm not talking about blind loyalty here, okay? But my pastor's directions looked right. That's why I was a member of their church. And I was supposed to follow the faith. Mm-hmm. And let me just say, I, I appreciate y'all following my faith to get this building. Amen. It was a big leap of faith for us to step out and get this building. This was expensive, amen. amen. But I don't regret it, amen. amen. I think we made. I think the Lord led us to right where He wanted us, and and I'm glad we got it. I was thinking about how when we set that tent up in the back, how that tent fit perfectly behind those. Big mesquites and pecan trees, and that had been back there for probably 30 years. And it was as if that tent from, you know, it was as if when those trees were planted 30 years ago, God knew one day we, Old Pat Baptist Church was going to be putting a tent up back there. Amen. It was just perfect. They made it fit perfect. I just, I just feel like the Lord had His hands on it. And I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord gave us this place. And I'm thankful that you followed the faith of your pastor. Needs a lot of work, but I'm I'm glad we got it. Amen? Amen. Now, several times I should have followed the faith of my pastor, but I didn't and learned the hard way. And thank God I never had any pastors, and I'll never try to lord over anybody. My pastors didn't try to lord over me either. You know, I believe in big boy, big girl rules. Amen? I don't try to lord over people and tell them what they have to do or... Uh, but but I sure do wish that I would have. And my pastors didn't me either. But they tried to guide me on some things and, I, and some things I didn't listen to. And I learned the hard way. When I was with Pastor Petrick, there was a real smooth talker that came to our church doing a financial seminar. He was from the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. Uh, the church that Brother Howells built up and There was a deacon named Tom Kimmel. He was hired by the pastor at that time, Jack Scott, to give financial counseling. Were you familiar with Brother Kimmel? Did you ever hear about his ministry? But he would go around and do financial seminars for churches. And he would actually, uh, any families that were interested, he would take them and help them set up a budget and give them financial advice. And he did this, and Pastor Petrick was present there, good old Pastor Petrick. He was trying to watch after his people. I don't think he fully understood what Mr. Kimmel was trying to do. And uh, we, My wife and I were impressed with this financial seminar, and he was offering uh, to help set up budgets and give uh, uh, investment advice. And we took him up on it, and we had a meeting with him. We scheduled a meeting with him and Pastor Petrick in his office. And Pastor Petrick sitting there, well, very wise of him because... He's probably thinking, you know, I don't know what this guy's all about. I want to be there and see what he's doing with my people. And uh, he was watching out for his flock. But my wife and I had just sold a house and had made about $40,000, I think is what it was. And this is it. I mean, this was our savings. This is all we had. And we wanted to invest it. And uh, this uh, smooth talker, Mr. Kimmel, was offering a... When, I, when we asked him, say, hey, Mr. Kimmel, uh, do, do, you, do you know where we can invest this money? Do you know anything we can do to invest this money? It was funny how he just automatically, uh, just all of a sudden just pulled something out. Yeah, I know exactly where you should do with the money. And he told us about uh, an incorporation uh, where it was guaranteed 12% return. You had to use 25, you had to, it was a minimum to get in. You had to have $25,000 minimum to get in. And that $25,000 would earn you $250 a month, $3,000 a year. And we didn't have any investments. So we were looking for some investments. So it sounded like a great deal. I asked Pastor Petrick, I said, hey, what do you think about this situation? He told me, he said, I wouldn't do it. He said, I would not do it. He advised me not to. I guess he saw something that I didn't see. I guess he was concerned about something. 
I said, well, I'm just going to get some other counsel. You know, the Bible says there's wisdom and a multitude of counsel, or safety, safety and a multitude of counselors. I said, I'll just get some other counsel, which I shouldn't have done. I should listen to my preacher. So I called Mr. Kimmel, and I said, hey, can you give me some more information about this? What actually are you investing in? And then can you give me some references, some people I can call to see how satisfied they are with this corporation, this investment? And I found out, Brother Williams, it was all surrounding, uh, it was all dealing with used cars. There were several used car lots in North Carolina. Where I'm from, actually, it was a, it was a very poor region of North Carolina, a lot of welfare. A lot of people can't get loans. And uh, <clears throat> they would go to these used car lots and they would give them car loans at like 25% interest. And <clears throat> I called some people, called some of these references. And, <clears throat> you know, I felt like it was taking advantage of people and I didn't feel real good about it. But I said, let me call some of these other people and see what they say about it. And I called one family that was on the mission field. They said that they had invested $600,000 into this corporation, and it was actually keeping them on the mission field. That was their support to keep them on the mission field. I talked to one lady. Her husband was disabled. She said they had put $180,000 in it and were getting like $1,800 a month or something like that. They said it was helping pay their bills. I talked to one pastor. I said, you know, this, isn't this usury? I mean, isn't this taking advantage of these people? He said, well, you know, we're actually doing them a favor. We're doing them a service because they couldn't get a loan otherwise. And uh, he said, this is a very biblical investment because you think about how God prospered all the Old Testament men of God. He would prosper them in camels and, you know, things like that. That's transportation. That was their transportation. This is, being, this is an investment in transportation. And uh, these guys were, were selling me on it. And then I found out that First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana had money tied up in it. I said, man, this is like one of the greatest churches in all the world. I said, this thing can't fail, man. I said, this thing can't fail. It's above failing. So I signed away our life savings, $25,000 of our life savings. I signed it away to this corporation. And it paid us for... Probably a couple years. But then I started getting cold feet. I said, man, I, I just don't feel right about this. And I tried to pull it out, <clears throat> but it was too late. It had, it had already gone bankrupt. And it turned out to be a total Ponzi scheme. A news article said Tom Kimmel was selling unsuspecting church goers on bunk investments. He collected $1.9 million in commissions and 300 plus people lost at least $16 million. I think we got a couple hundred, when it went to court, I think we got a couple hundred dollars out of about $25,000 back. You know, if we're not careful, we'll try to rationalize and justify going against clear scripture. That's what I was doing. I was trying to justify going against clear scripture, going against my pastor's recommendation. And I had to learn the hard way. I went against the faith of my pastor in, in clear scripture. Proverbs 28, 28 says, or 28, 8 says, He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. God frowns on usury. God frowns on unjust gain. And he says, if you, if you uh, increase your substance by taking advantage of people, God's going to take it away from you. God's going to say, how did I miss that? How did I miss that clear verse? I should have just listened to my pastor. Even if I didn't know this, even if I hadn't discovered this, I should have just listened to my pastor. Amen. By the time I decided I wanted to take it out, it was too late. Again, the company had gone bankrupt, and Mr. Kimmel was fixing to be sentenced to 22 years in jail. He was 68 at the time. He'll probably die. I would imagine he'll die in jail. Mr. Tom Kimmel here, deacon of the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. Now, $25,000 is a lot of money now, but it was a whole lot back then. Amen. A whole lot back, a whole lot back then. And I caused my family to suffer. I put my wife, man, my wife uh, was very stressed out over that situation. 
I, 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 I messed up our savings, I shall listen to my pastor. I'll tell you another time I shall listen to my pastor. I saw a young preacher on the internet. He's making a big splash. Uh, he's preaching hard against sin and the wickedness of our day, he's preaching against Calvinism. He said that Calvinists would be his enemies to the day he died. And I hate Calvinism, Calvinism with a passion. I hate Calvinism worse than I do Jehovah's false witnessism. Because Jehovah's false witnessism has never crept into good soul winning independent Baptist churches like Calvinism has. This guy's leading a big soul winning charge. He's going to all these cities around the United States, big major cities, and leading the soul winning charge. He's defending the King James Bible. And since he's flip flopped on all these things, he's just recently took to social media to point out what he considered an error in the King James Bible. Some of you preachers know, some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Stephen Anderson, the one who made the documentary New World Order Bible Versions in defense of the King James, has just recently taken to social media, knee-jerkingly, taking to social media to say there's an error in the King James Bible. Hard to believe, ain't it? Hard to believe. He's discovered, he's the only one in the last 400 years who's, uh, who's smart enough to discover this mistake in the King James Bible. This supposed error in the King James Bible. And I'm probably going to be getting a little bit more in depth on that particular thing here coming up. Uh, I got a sermon I'm going to preach. Four things that are constantly, constantly under attack. One of them is the King James Bible. So I'm going to deal with that here. Uh, probably coming up, I'm not going to get too much into it right now. But the, the fact is, so he's preaching on a Thursday night and discovers what he thinks is an error in the King James, and within hours he takes to social media to point out this error he's found in the King James. Didn't even pray about it. Within hours took to the internet to, to point out a mistake. And I'm like, even if you would have found a mistake, it's not a legitimate mistake. There is no legitimate mistake. There is no mistakes in this King James Bible. But even if you found one, what's the point? What are you gaining? Yes, what benefit is it for you to go to the internet and air this out? There is none. The only thing that he, 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 the only thing that he can accomplish by that is to make himself look like a sparty pants. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. right. Or stir up strife so he can get air time. And look, if you had not already stopped allowing him to influence you, you know, if, if, if him lying on your pastor wasn't enough, if him denying that the blood of Jesus Christ was sufficient, uh, if, if him uh, saying there's not one word to condemn the uh, pastor using the F-bomb, if all that wasn't enough to uh, get you uh, off of his influence, maybe pointing out an error in the King James will. Amen. Amen? I hope you will now. Stop allowing the F word Baptist Church to influence you. What a fitting name, man. You, you couldn't make that up. F word Baptist Church, man. That is a very fitting name, amen. Uh, for the faithful word Baptist Church there in uh, Tempe, Arizona, Pastor uh, Stephen Anderson. Now, he's a kingdom builder, but he's building the wrong one. He's all about self. I built this, I built that. And it took me a few years to recognize that. And by the time I did recognize it, it was too late. It was too late. My pastor had already told me that he didn't want anything to do with him. My pastor had already told me he's oozing with pride and arrogance. Now, my pastor did not want to lord over me. He never told me you can't listen to him or don't listen to him or don't have anything to do with him. But he made it clear he didn't approve and that something was wrong with him. And I should have heeded his Warning. I should have listened to my pastor and my wife, by the way. My wife tried to tell me, don't have nothing to do with him. I should have heeded the warning. I should have listened. I tried to leave and distance myself quietly from this man. He went on a smear campaign against me and several of my pastor friends uh, that were loyal to the Bible over man. He lied on me. Uh, to 130,000 of his followers, his buddies lied on me. He caused a lot of drama. He caused a lot of pain, especially on my dear wife, especially on my family. And uh, what him and his group have turned into be is totally an embarrassment for me. 
It's an embarrassment for me that I ever had anything to do with them. And all of this would have been avoided if I would have listened to my pastor. My pastor tried to warn me, but I didn't heed his warning. And it still haunts me to this day. My association with this man still haunts me to this day. And I, I don't have time to get into all that, but it still haunts me. My pastor said, he said, he made this comment. He said, they will bite and devour one another. Now, how he knew that, how he saw that, how he could see that, I don't know. But he said they will bite and devour one another. Is that not what they've done? And they tried to bite and devour me. There's been two serious mistakes that caused a lot of pain in my life that could have been prevented if I would have listened to the men that God gave to watch for my soul. God tried to spare me from this pain, and God tried to spare me from this suffering, but I didn't listen. I didn't listen. Number one, I had to learn the hard way not listen to my pastor. Number two, I had to learn the hard way not walking guard around my pasture. Not walking guard around my pasture. Now, I preached a sermon, I don't know, probably a year ago or so, uh, or six months ago, about... Uh, Lessons from sheep. Lessons I've learned from tending a small little flock of sheep. I had three ewes and one ram. And just some lessons that God has used sheep to teach me. Uh, Proverbs 27, 23. Look at Proverbs 27, 23 if you would. And I'm not going to preach the whole sermon. I'm just going to remind you of one point. Some of you weren't here. Uh, but look at Proverbs 27, 23. 27, verse number 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Now, last spring, I lost three of my ewes. Female sheep uh, valued at about $400 a piece. That's what I paid for them, $400 a piece. And I lost them all because I did not walk guard around my pasture. If I would have walked guard around my pasture... I would have noticed a very obvious tunnel underneath my fence that coyotes were digging. You couldn't miss it. You could see their paw prints. You could see where they had piled up dirt. You could see where they clearly had a, enough room to go underneath that fence. But I failed to walk guard around my pasture, something I try to do now on a frequent basis, walk guard around my pasture. Check, make sure nothing's trying to tunnel under it. By the time I discovered it, it was too late. I had three dead ewes at the cost of $1,200. That's not including all the feed I had fed them. That's not including the uh, medicines I had had to give them, ivermectin and uh, you know uh, penicillin and things I'd had to give them. Let me remind you, Daddy, you have some sheep you've been put in charge of. Amen. Walk guard around your pasture, Daddy. Don't make some of the same mistakes I did by not walking guard around my pasture. Walk guard around your pasture. Walk guard around your home, Daddy. You know, never has there been something as destructive to the home and to your children as a smartphone. The most destructive thing to ever enter a Christian's home is a smartphone. Or just, you know, the internet in general. See, back when I was a young boy, if you want to look at something inappropriate, you know what you had to do? You had to snoop around in your dad's closet and look for girly books or go to your buddy's house and look up, look around the house, look underneath your dad, his dad's bed, and in and, and his shoebox, in his in his closet. You had to snoop around and look for girly books and inappropriate uh, material. Now it's in the front pocket of our children's, uh, your son's pants, the front pocket or the back pocket uh, of your, your your son's pants if he's a boy, uh, your 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 daughter's purse if she's a girl. And it's destroying, destroying their physical health and their spiritual health. Amen. Some of you have a hard time getting a hold of me because uh, my phone's on airplane mode a lot. Well, the reason being is I don't want to fry my prostate. 
You know, they say that men, you know, men, that's a very common ailment of men. They get prostate cancer. They say it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You will live long enough, you will get prostate cancer. Well, I'll tell you what, you keep that cell phone in your pocket, you're probably going to speed it up a little bit, mm -hmm. quite a bit. Destroying their health, radiating their brains, radiating themselves. And then, you know, this 5G radiation is supposed to be very bad for you. And uh, destroying their spiritual health. They're scarring themselves with things they got no business looking at. God never wanted them to see. You know, my advice for you, number one, is don't get them a phone unless they have a legitimate need for it. They ought to have some type of really legitimate need to even have a phone. But number two, if you get them a phone, you should have some filters on it or just don't have internet on it or have some filters on it. You know, get covenant eyes so you can see exactly what they're looking at. Get a filter called Bark. Do something. Walk guard around your pasture, Daddy. You say, well, I don't know how to do all that stuff. Well, then don't get them a phone until you figure it out. I don't know how to use covenant eyes. Don't get them a phone until you figure it out. I don't know how to use bark. Don't get them a phone until you figure it out. Well, I trust them. You're being foolish. I don't trust myself. Much less a teen. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Stuff will pop up and catch their eye and catch their attention, and you know how hard it is to not click on it. Walk go around your pasture, Daddy. There's a lion trying to dig under the fence. Say amen. My wife, I let my wife deal with that. She wanted to get, I, I didn't want him to have a cell phone. She wanted to get him a cell phone. I said, because she needed one. She said, you know, I want them to have a phone they can use. Uh, um, you know, Mandy got a job and was working, and and and, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, they're home. Me and my wife are away, and they want to have a home phone. I said, okay, if you get them, if you're going to get them a phone, then you're going to monitor it. You're going to watch it. She's got Bark on there, and she's got AT and T uh, app where she can monitor what they're looking at. Amen. You better do that, Daddy, Amen. Right. or Mama. Have Mama do it. Somebody better do it. Yeah. I said, number one, not listen to my pastor. I had to learn school of hard knocks. Number two, not walking guard around my pasture. Number three, spending too much time on the phone. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Spending too much time on the phone. Now, this is a recent lesson I just learned last week. I eat twice a day normally. My first meal is typically steak and eggs. Amen? Amen. Now, let me just tell you how I do it. Let me just give you some... Uh, instructions here. I prefer to use a cast iron skillet, but I don't have my cast iron skillet right now. We left it at Airbnb and I ain't got it back yet. But I have a, a stainless steel skillet we use right now. And I put my steak in there and I get it, I, I, I put a coarse bed of sea salt and I put cooking oil, whatever I'm using, butter, or lard, or olive oil, whatever. And I get one side good and seared, get some crust built up on it. And then I flip it over. And then I just turn it off. And I crack me a few eggs in there, probably about half a dozen eggs. That's a few, amen. I crack me about a half a dozen eggs in there. And I put a lid over it. And it causes it to steam a little bit. And you can tell, I like my eggs a little runny, a medium. And, but I don't like my whites runny. That's nasty, man. Runny whites is sick. So I put a lid over it. And you can tell when they're just right when a little white film goes over your yolk. When you see a white film cover your yolk, you know your whites are done, but your yolk is still a little runny. So you can dig, dip your steak in there, amen? amen. And uh, now my favorite steak that I use, now if I could afford, you know, if I had Brother Curtis's money or Dion's money, I'd be eating ribeyes every, every morning. Yeah. But because I don't, I'm eating chuck eye steaks. Now, a chuck eye steak is called a poor man's ribeye. It's very similar in flavor. Hey, Amen. I feel, feel getting filled with the Holy Ghost right now. Amen. 
It's very similar in flavor. It's very similar in fat content as a ribeye. It's got a lot of good marbling. And it's actually got the tenderness of a ribeye because it's taken from close proximity of a ribeye. There's your sermon on chuck eyes. Amen. Now, I shouldn't be telling you about this because the last time I told you about a Denver steak, uh, they got very popular and they jumped from eight ninety nine dollars a pound to fourteen ninety nine dollars a pound. And, uh, you know, so I'm going to have a hard time finding chuck eyes now at Walmart. But uh, anyway, I love chuck eye steaks. Amen. And every time I go into Walmart, I, I look to see if they got a good looking chuck eye. I look to see if they got a good marbled chuck eye. And I noticed recently they've jumped up to twelve ninety nine dollars a pound, man. That is crazy. The poor, it used to be seven ninety nine a pound. The poor man's ribeye is now costing what the rich man uh, ribeye costs. Amen. It's crazy. But I had just put a precious sought after chuck eye steak in my skillet last week. And I just wanted to get it seared on that one side. That takes a couple of minutes. And I said, let me go outside and get my phone real quick. And I went outside and got my phone and noticed a buddy of mine had texted me and I wanted to respond to his text and I got caught up in it and I came back in the house and as soon as I opened the door, I could smell it. And my, I, I, I fainted in fear. I said, oh no, not my precious Chuck Eye. And smoke was billowing off the skillet by the time I got in there, man. And I had to open the windows up. The house was all smoked up. And man, my heart was broken. I said, what a waste. Man, I even started doubting, was there even a God, man? I said, God, are you even real? I said, how could you let this happen, God? If you're real, how could this even have happened? And I, I said, well... Why is that beautiful chuck eye ruined, Lord? I said, Lord, why would you let that beautiful chuck eye get ruined? And I got to think and said, Lord, anything, man. I, I said, Lord, I'd rather my hot water heater go out. I'd rather anything have happened than that chuck eye. I was looking forward to it. Now I just got to eat eggs without a chuck eye. And I said, why did this happen, Lord? What are you trying to teach me? And then a the thought came into my heart. Spending too much time on that phone cost you, son. Spending too much time on that phone will mess things up for you. You need to learn and you need to be aware. That phone is going to cost you. That phone is going to hurt you. That phone messes up our marriages. That phone messes up our relationships with our kids. Man, I don't think I'll ever forget when Rosa's adopted son, Johnny, or Jordan, Jordan got in the accident, got killed. Young man who got saved and baptized at our church. And we went to the prayer vigil. And Jordan's buddy who got killed, his mom was there. And his mom was just beating herself up. And telling everybody at prayer vigil, I should have put my phone down. I should have spent more time with him. I shouldn't have paid so much attention with their phone. That was what was going through her heart. And that was what was going through her mind as we were having a prayer vigil for her uh, dead son. Was that she put the phone before her son. And it was haunting her. It was eating at her. Do you know that no one says on their deathbed, I wish I had spent more time with my phone? <laughs> Nobody says that. Nobody says, I wish I would have paid more attention to my phone. They say, I wish I had paid more attention to my kids. I wish I had paid more attention to my family. I wish I had read my Bible more. Whatever the case may be. Man, that phone... Messes up relationships with our spouses. Messes up relationships with your kids. Messes up relationships with the Lord. Man, we let's just face it. We are hooked on it. We are absolutely hooked on this phone. Now proof of it is what you do when you're at a red light. 
Your body is craving for a dopamine hit so much from your phone, you know it and I know it. When we're in a red light, we're reaching for our phones. Why? We're hooked on them. And then you don't look up until you hear somebody honking behind you. And you look, and the car in front of you is a quarter mile down the road already. Why? Because you get taken away. You get taken away by it. Our brains are craving dopamine hits. You know what we need to do? We need to try to establish some rules with this phone, or, or it's just going to ruin. It's going to ruin things for us. It's going to be a very expensive. Uh, it's it's going to cost us. These phones are going to put us through the school of hard knocks. They put uh, Jordan's buddy's mom up through the school of hard knocks. She said, "I wish I had known where my son was. I wish I had uh, spent more time with my son. Maybe he would still be alive right now." I was blown away that her, 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 the prayer vigil for her son, what was going through her heart and what was going through her mind was her phone usage yeah. and regret. And I don't want to have that. Yeah. We need to have some rules. Some rules that I've tried to establish in my own life is no phone at the table, man. Now, if I'm there by myself, eating by myself like I have to sometimes, and I, it's whatever. But when it's family time and you're at the table, or uh, you and your wife are out on a date, put that stupid thing up. Yeah. Leave it in the car. Amen. Don't have that phone at the dinner table. When you when, when you're having family time, have family time. Amen. Put it up, man. I mean, if you, if, if you, you, you know, if, if you're into social media and, and you, you know, you're into it and you enjoy it and you're able to control it and use it for God's glory, why don't you have some social media breaks? Don't just get on at any time during the day. Man, why don't you wait until your lunch break or wait until the evening when the kids are in bed or something? Why don't you schedule times for that? You know, doesn't the Bible say do things decently and in order? Have some order in your life when it comes to social media and phones. And How about this? How about just monitor your time watch? You notice this thing on, on uh, uh, YouTube called Time Watched? Why don't you say, okay, I'm only going to allow X amount of time per day. Maybe you allow more time on the weekend. Maybe you allow more time when you're sick, whatever. I do that. I try not to watch a, over X amount of videos uh, or time on, the, uh, on YouTube a day. I go to Time Watch to see, try to look at how much time I've spent on that. How about this? Don't look at nose book before you get your nose in the book. <laughs> Call it nose book. Everybody's putting their nose in everybody's business, right? But. Now I don't have if I if I need to look at Noah's book I, I get on my you know my wife's got an account just so we can look at our church stuff and monitor things and uh, I don't have it my, and and it's not because I'm better than anybody else or holier now or anything like that my wife never has wanted me to have it because she's known people who uh, you know one of her good friends in the Navy her husband got hooked up with some high school sweetheart on Facebook and. She just doesn't want me to have that temptation, doesn't want me to have that as a stumbling block. I don't have it, but if I need to look at something, like I'll use her phone, and then she can monitor it. And, uh, you know, so I don't have nose book pulling on me, but I do have things pulling on me. I got redneck things pulling on me. I got an app on my phone that texts my phone trail camera pictures. I've got two trail cameras set up on two different feeders. And I'm always curious when I wake up, I wonder if that buck came in last night. I wonder what that buck's doing. I'm always curious. Did I get any new bucks moving through? And I'm always curious. And I got it pulling at me. And I, I've, I've told myself, you know what? I'm not going to check my Moultrie app. I'm not going to check these things until I get my devotions done. Until I pray for y'all. Get my prayer time done. I, you know, I pray every day 
uh, for a specific section of our church roster. Do I get my prayer time done? Do I get my, uh, pray for my church family? Pray for my family. I want to show the Lord those things are more important to me than a, a buck. Why don't you show the Lord that His book's more important to you than Facebook? Amen? Amen. You know what? Another thing is you can really mess your life up. This phone, these phones that we're hooked to, these phones that we can't do without, you can really mess your life up uh, physically by hurting someone. You can really mess your life up or someone else's life physically Messing with that thing while you're driving. Messing with phones while you're driving. I like what Brother James does. I texted him the other day, and I know this is probably the safety in him. He uh, works in construction. Uh, uh, a lot of construction guys are just really mindful of safety, safety conscious. You have to have safety meetings every day, and you see guys get hurt on the job a lot, and you're constantly thinking about safety if you're in the construction industry. And I texted him the other day, and it said, I'm driving with focus turned on. He said, I'll see your message when I get where I'm going. I guess it was an automatic text. I've never seen that before. I said, man, that's a good idea. i got to figure out how to get that turned on when I'm driving. So uh, I'm not tempted to uh, text people or respond to texts and answer texts while driving. That's why I prefer to listen to, listen to music that Brother Curtis has downloaded on my phone for me. I like to listen to that or I like to listen to podcasts when I'm driving because I'm trying to listen to a playlist on YouTube. Uh, I got to listen to a stupid ad and I'm going to be tempted to skip it. And I'm going to be tempted to mess with my phone and I'm trying to uh, limit distractions while I'm driving because everybody else is messing with their phone and we need to make sure we pay attention to the road because of them. Amen? Because you all the other, other texters out there. These phones will cost us and get us in trouble if we're not careful. I know a young woman, uh, I, I'm not a young lady, but I know a lady who's older than me uh, back in my hometown was texting, driving down the road, and, and, and veered into the other lane and had a head-on collision and killed someone. And they sued them. And they should have. And could you imagine living with that on your conscience the rest of your life? You killed someone because you broke the law and were messing around with a phone. You think about that sometimes. Man, you got, you got about 2,000 pounds of steel, sometimes 40,000 pounds of steel, if it's an 18-wheeler, they're hauling something, separating you by feet. And you're going to mess with your phone? It's craziness. It's craziness how distracted we are with these stupid phones. And they're going to cost us if we're not careful. Turn to Acts 18.5. I'm almost done. i got to hurry up here. Acts 18.5, last one. I said, number one, not listen to your pastor. Number two, not walk in guard around uh, my pasture. Uh, number three, spending too much time on the phone. Number four, not listening to the Holy Spirit. i got to hurry up here. Acts 18, verse number 5. Acts chapter 18, verse number 5. <clears throat> and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. I want you to notice how the Holy Spirit pressed upon Paul's heart to testify, to witness. Now, I'm a big believer in the pressing of the Holy Spirit. I try to be sensitive to the pressing of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit presses on me to witness, to testify. I was going to Waco not that long ago. I was going to pick up something there. That's been probably a year or two ago. And uh, there's, there's been lots of examples. I could share many examples like this, but this is just one that popped in my head. I was going to Waco on high, uh, Interstate 35. I was hungry, needed some gas, pulled into a gas station. I was going to get some burger patties from uh, Burger King. And uh, I noticed that there was a big Greyhound bus, Mexican tags on it. Uh, I guess a uh, tour bus or something from coming from Mexico, United States, or, or uh, I don't know what it's all, all they were doing. All I know is that I just saw a, a bunch of people huddled up together, probably a hundred people, stretching their legs. And I thought to myself, man, I don't speak Spanish, but we got a Spanish video on our, our, on our card. And I said, man, this is what an opportunity. What an opportunity. And I started feel, feeling that pressing from the Holy Spirit. And I started thinking about, wow. This is no coincidence that I just happened to be here at this exact gas station at the same time they are. 
and they're standing there, and I just happen to have a whole stack of tracks with the Spanish gospel on them. This no coincidence. And I started feeling this pressing. So I just said, okay, I walked over there and gave them all one. Hey, I got some good news for you. Gave them all one. I felt the pressing. Now, it's not always obeyed that pressing, and it cost me. It cost me a very expensive mistake one time. About 2005-ish, right around 2005, we had a Bible study. It was stationed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. We had a Bible study on base. We got permission from the chaplain to have a Bible study on base trying to reach the Marines. And every Saturday morning, we would go to the chow hall because the Marines would be lined up, man. It would be 150, probably 200 Marines lined up to get breakfast. And we'd walk out. And we'd give them tracks. Whole line, man. I mean, you give a whole, whole, you know, 125, 150 tracks out in five minutes. And we'd invite them to our Bible study. We weren't technically supposed to be doing it. We were just kind of asking for, for forgiveness instead of permission. Amen. And I had given everybody in the line a track. And I was heading to the van. I was in a church van. And had a guy from church with me. And I saw a master gunnery sergeant. It's as high as you can get enlisted in the Marine Corps. And a, there's a staff sergeant or master sergeant, I can't remember. They were walking out. And I crossed their path. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, <coughs> press on my heart, give them one too. And I started saying, well, reasoning with myself, well, we're not supposed to be doing this, and if I give them one, they might complain. They might try to shut us down. We might not be able to do this anymore. They might get us in trouble. And I heard that pressing say, Master Gunnery Sergeants need to be saved too. Master Gunnery Sergeants need the gospel too. Amen. No matter how, how high they are, they need it too. Amen. But I disobeyed the pressing. I went and got in the church van, Brother Williams, and I'm backing the church van up. And I'm backing the church van up. And I'm backing the church van up. And all of a sudden, I hear something. And it don't sound good. It sounds like metal flexing and bending. And I look in my rearview mirror, and I headed back right into the car to that master gunnery sergeant and that staff sergeant we're driving in. So I pulled up. I went into chow hall. And I said, Master Guns, I am so sorry. I said, here's my ID. Here's my driver's license. I have just backed into your rental vehicle. I bet just backed into your car. And he says, that's okay. He says, it's a rental. But let's go outside and look at the damage. I told him who I was. I told him why we were there. I said, we have a Bible study and we're just out here trying to invite people to, to church, invite them to the Bible study and everything. And he said, we looked at the damage, and he said, I'm going to need to get your church's information so I can, you know, turn it into the insurance. He said, can you tell it to me so I can write it down? I said, oh, don't worry about writing it down. I said, just take one of these tracks right here. And that was when I told myself, see, I hear you, Lord. I hear you. Yeah. It'd been a whole lot easier, a whole lot less expensive, a whole lot less hard if I had just done it the way I was supposed to do it. Yeah. The Lord wanted that master gunnery sergeant to get a track, and he was going to get him one one way or the other. Right. I had to go through the school of hard knocks to get it to him, but he got it. Amen. Amen. It had been a lot easier, a lot better, a lot less expensive if I had just re responded to and obeyed the pressing of the Holy Ghost to start with. School of Hard Knocks. This is an expensive sermon. This sermon, co I mean, this sermon cost me a lot of money. Thousands of dollars. A lot of heartache, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. I hope you'll learn from my mistakes so you don't have to experience the same thing I experienced. Miss Amber, if you'll come at this time.
There's been four people that I got in trouble for not listening to. The Lord through his word, the Holy Ghost through the pressing, my pastor, and my wife. And there's been times where I'm glad I didn't listen to my wife. <laughs> because I knew what the Lord wanted. My wife, I'll be just be honest with you, she wasn't a big fan of me starting a church. She knew that's what the Lord called me to do, and she was willing to follow. She was willing to get in line. She's willing to stand beside me. She's still doing it today, and praise God for her. Like Brother William said, this, being a pastor's wife is the hardest job in the ministry. The hardest job in the ministry is being a pastor's wife. And I'm thankful for her. I'm glad for her. But if I'd have listened to her, we probably wouldn't have a church right now. Now, there's been times where I wanted to quit, and she said, no, you ain't quitting. Get back in there. <laughs> so I, I did listen to her then. Okay. More times than not, I wish I would have listened to my wife and heeded her, her intuition. More times than not, I wish I would have listened to my wife and heeded her intuition because she is our help meet. Amen. She is, she is my help meet. Amen. But that's why I've got myself in trouble. Not listening to my pastor. Not listening to the Lord through his clear word. Uh, not walking guard around my pasture. Not heeding the pressing. And what was the other one? Somebody help me out. I don't even remember. Let's see. Not listening to my pastor, not walking around my pasture, spending too much time on the phone. Spending too much time on the phone. Spending too much time on the phone. Not listening to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed.